Yes, the next uh, speaker on the program today is Tim Powell from the UK. Uh, the title of his presentation is uh, An Overview of Immersive Storytelling Principles. And Tim will share experiences and also case studies from, from his work. And Tim Powell creates award-winning um, experiences that combine immersive XR technology, live performance and physical installations. Welcome, Tim. Hello there, lovely to, lovely to be here with you all. Now, let's just make sure this works. <laughs> um, as I said, lovely to be there. The, um, the, my only sadness is that I'm not able to be there in person. <laughs> The last time I spoke to the Swedish audience, I was in Gothenburg and I had just a tremendous time. So, um, but this is the next best thing. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, just to run through, what, what do we mean by immersive storytelling? I think immersive is a word that is very overused um, in so many different contexts. Um, and just to kind of get an understanding of what we really mean by that and why it's special and different, just a, a run through of how we can use technology to create that kind of immersion. Uh, and then some of the key aspects of immersive storytelling, the things that really make it different, the, the types of immersion that you can create, the idea of you being present or embodied in, in the world that, that you've created, and um, you know, the, kind of the, big, the big topic, which is the fact that the audience has agency, they have control over the experience that they're, that they're having. And I'd just like to push that slightly further into the, into the idea that immersive storytelling is actually not, it, it, it's the difference from storytelling is that it's actually story doing because of that story, because of that audience agency. And actually what that does to our bodies and to our brains is, is more about making memories than following narrative. So just, just bear with me, I hope to explain that later. Um, and then just to finish off with a little about what this means for, for organisations. So, so what is immersive storytelling? What is immersion? And I think really at the core of it all is this triangle of three things. It's the, it's the story, it's the audience, and it's the technology. And there's, with immersive storytelling, there's just this kind of uh, interdependence of all of these things. You know, no, normally you'd come up with a story first and then tell it through a channel or through... Um, you know, in different ways for audiences, but actually the creative process for immersive storytelling, you take all of those things simultaneously. So immersive experiences are, are those that completely surround a person and make them feel part of an alternative environment, a different world, a new world. So how is this different from traditional storytelling? Well, you know, to push the analogies, this is, this is a film without a screen. This is a theatre without a stage, and this is art without the frame around it. And one of the ways I like to think about this is that immersive stories are those which are often told through the body, not just the mind. They're things that we physically experience rather than just consume. They're also stories that are told in space as well as time. It's not just about being a passive audience member, but it's about, uh, it's about you know, physically moving through a space or actually telling a story that is spread over space. Can I just say, if you can hear rummaging in the background, we have a very little puppy <laughs> and um, she's a bit lively. Um, and because of this, you know, because of this, this is necessarily collaborative. It's this, it's this constant kind of uh, symbiosis of story and audience and technology. Um, and what does that do? That the, the one way to describe the change is about the real blurring between the difference between the author and the audience, because the audience suddenly becomes a participant in creating the story, creating the narrative. And it also is a blurring of the lines between the art or the entertainment itself and the way it's marketed. Because good digital activity has, you know, it's it has its own distribution built in, it makes its own noise. So that's I think the big shifts that that, that, that have taken us to immersive storytelling. Now, just a little about how we can use technology. This is a, a funny picture from a, an R&D lab we ran. Um, I should say that, that previously, before uh, going freelance, I ran the, um, the R&D studio for Historic Royal Palaces in the UK, in London. 
Historic Royal Palace is uh, the charity that runs the Tower of London and Hampton Court Palace and lots of those um, UK heritage tourist attractions. And the, the R&D studio was an in-house innovation lab. And the idea was that we were focusing particularly on immersive technologies and how they interact with the physical spaces of the palaces and, and live performance um, to create new types of visitor experience. So immersive technologies are those that extend or replace the reality for the, for the user. And we often, the kind of the go-to, you know, we, we often immediately think of this, what we call the XR spectrum, so the kind of more visual end of, uh, of immersive technologies. Um, so, you know, on one end you've got the real world, on the other end you've got virtual reality, a completely, completely fabricated world that surrounds the user. Um, and in between, you've got augmented reality, which is where you overlay uh, digital concept onto a live view of the real world. And then this interesting hybrid um, augmented virtuality, which is where physical objects in, in the real world are mapped into a virtual world. So, so you're having the person in the virtual world is able to kind of get that tactile feedback from, from the real world, which kind of really deepens immersion. And um, I've always been an ad advocate in my career of the power of non-visual experiences and non-visual technology. Um, here, here's a, a couple of kind of wild examples. These are, these are experiments in digital taste and digital smell. They're, they're a little way. I think maybe COVID might have <laughs> delayed these a little down the line. But, but certainly sound is, is an incredibly, incredibly powerful um, medium. And you'll see lots of my work has been in, in sound. Um, the the go-to is always visual. But actually, the power of the experience or the, you know, the, the, the kind of deepness of the immersion can often be achieved with non-visual technologies um, more easily and certainly more cheaply. And then I think the, a really useful concept is, is the, this idea of seeking out the unique affordances of a, um, a, of a technology. And what we mean by that is, is, is really focusing in on those... Um, focusing in on those uh, human behaviours that the technology allows that have previously been impossible. So they're things that were impossible in analogue. Um, I'm really sorry about this. Um, so this, this example I've got here is um, some, some uh, close neighbours of your Macropole who are, who are based in Copenhagen uh, in Denmark. And this, this was a show called The Shared Individual, where you sat in the audience wearing VR headsets and you were looking back at yourself um, in the audience. And essentially they pulled a magic trick where you were calibrated with the actor wearing the, wearing the, uh, wearing the camera that was, that was filming you back. And they pulled a magic trick which made you believe that you disappeared. And it was, it was a really smart, smart show, I think, because it really, really honed in on, on something um, the idea that you would embody uh, this, you know, the actor on stage to the extent that you, you would believe that you disappeared. And it was, it was hilarious. Everyone suddenly gasped and was checking that they were still there in the world. So, um, so yeah, technology, look at those things that you've never been able to do in analog um, and always think of it as a tool to solve problems. And you know the, the exciting thing is that technologies unlock new human behaviours. It shouldn't be the other way around. So, the Lost Palace is is a project we ran a few years ago. Some of you may have, uh, have heard of it already, um, or seen me present it. I think uh, it'd be useful just to talk about it in, in light of that previous uh, section about unique affordances and how technology can be used. Um, because I think there were certain elements of it that, that um, we got right in that respect. So the idea of this show was that the Historic Royal Palaces look after Banqueting House, which is uh, one building on, on Whitehall, but it was actually the only, the last remaining part of Whitehall Palace, which was 150 rooms. It was the biggest palace in Europe at the time, and it burnt down in, in uh, fire 300 years ago. And it's now uh, it's kind of 
really central London. So it's Downing Street, it's, it's the Houses of Parliament, it's the kind of, it's the real heart of London. So what we wanted to do is take people around those modern streets and give them experiences of the history that once happened there, where of course we had no buildings and, and no kind of visual representation of, of those spaces. Um, so this is what we came up with. And if we could um, play the video now, if I stop sharing screen. Is that okay for, for the video? This debauchery that I hear tell of at the cock in for which you were indicted. Oh, no, between the trial and his wrath! Sarah! Have you heard? The queen is now besotted by Queen Catherine's. Both that you may marry and that I may join you together in marriage. Things of a bad man. Sure, we And it was Her Majesty. Catherine of Braganza. Yes! Come on, Rochester. Break it. Come on, smash it. <laughs> Dread ocean haze. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so just a few of the technologies then that enabled this, this immersion. The first was, was binaural sound, and, and that's us filming on location, or sorry, recording on location with the binaural microphone, which is the head um, there. Binaural sound records sound as the human head perceived it. So humans are very good at uh, uh, sensing the direction and closeness of sound. Um, the binaural head has microphones in both of the ears of it and the actors perform to it. So what this does is, is two things. Uh, one is that it makes the, it, from the audience point of view, it makes it feel like the actors are speaking directly to you. So you can be addressed. So rather than a, someone who's listening to a scene, you're actually kind of an active participant in it. The second is that if you record audio in particular architectural spaces, um, the brain is very, very good at working out the kind of sp the space that sound is coming from. So even though people were stood in, in the open air in, along busy roads, they got the sense that they were in these lost buildings. Um, the second is, is gesture recognition. Um, you, you saw the kind of sword fight, which it was a bit of, you know, it was a bit of fun. There were other things you had to do. It, it became a, a cockerel in a cockfight at one point, etc. So this this was the this is the kind of real idea that you kind of act out act out the um the performance and you have to do certain gestures in order to to move the the experience on so so to kind of unlock the next stages. But the the one that I think was the most memorable part of it 
uh, was that in the scene which was Charles II's execution, which happened outside of Banqueting House, the audio uh, was, was you, were, you were hearing the king uh, preparing for, for the execution, obviously a very emotive um, piece of drama, but when you were holding the device in your hands, it started to, to physically beat with a human heartbeat. So you, you were listening to someone preparing for death and feeling their heartbeat in, in your hands. And the moment the, the axe dropped, the heartbeat stopped. So that was, that was the kind of, and that was the only time we used haptics in, in the whole experience, just for that kind of, the idea that you were physically, physically touching, physically sensing another human being. So back to the, um, the kind of, what I think are the key characteristics of a, a immersive storytelling. Um, and I think it's really useful first to, to, to just to summarize really and, and look into the types of immersion that are possible, because I think they, they really do create very different types of Vista experience. So the first is, is spatial or atmospheric immersion. This is a world that seems physically believable and that you feel kind of enabled to, to explore. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to use uh, uh, examples that, that some are technology based, some are not. So this picture here is for a, uh, a, an immersive theatre show by the brilliant Punch Drunk. Um, so the people wearing the strange masks are the audience members, but they're completely free to roam about the entire set, um, it, it, which is you know, populated by the actors. But it's the, the idea that it's, it's, a, it's an entire world that you're able to, to explore. The second is, is, and this is more of a kind of mental immersion, is a tactical immersion, which is a real skills-based thing. Uh, it's fast-paced, you need to respond to things. It's quite often predicated on a sort of threat, so it's, you know, zombies. This example here is um, Beat Saber, which is a kind of dance, kind of martial art type hybrid game. Uh, the next is, is a more um, strategic immersion. Uh, a kind of slower, longer term, a much more kind of cerebral mental challenge, the equivalent of the kind of game of chess. And I know you've, you've just been speaking about Minecraft, but it's the idea that you, you um, have an experience in there where maybe the world itself isn't kind of, you know, it's very obviously not real. It's not trying to be a simulation of reality, but the type, the range of experiences and the amount of control you have in that world makes it a very kind of, you know, the immersion is very, very long, long lasting within that. Then there's narrative immersion. Again, this is certainly not technology, not only technology based at all. Um, and that's just the, the real, you know, old fashioned absorption in the story. We've connected to a character. We want to know what happens next. It's being lost in a good book or a good film. And then the final, I think, is, is a, a kind of sensory immersion, a sort of sensory overload, which is, I guess, is quite often used to be transcendent or meditative or, or focused on well-being and that, that sort of thing. This photo here is, is Team Lab, um, the kind of the Japanese creators of these enormous kind of sensory worlds, which, which you can subtly interact with um, by, by physically interacting with them with your, with your body. And then there's also a sense that the nature of the world that you create is, is a key thing to the type of experience. So is this, you know, the, the, the bottom picture there is a 360 degree VR film. So it, it's captured in, in, in video, but it's obviously you're free to, to look around. The top one there is obviously um, CGI, computer graphics. The, you know, the, this is kind of a really fundamental difference on, on the way your audience is perceives and uses that world there's obviously big technical questions about all of this you know video um uh, 360 video at the moment doesn't allow the same amount of movements um so but it all but it obviously is, is a much more kind of uh, obviously it's much more of a simulation of reality and simulation of of humans the next important concept i think is is the idea of presence or embodiment when you're sat uh, watching a play on stage, I don't, you don't believe you're on the stage, you don't believe you're in the play, the same with a film. The way uh, immersive experiences work is that it appeals to so many of your different senses that actually your body is telling your brain that you are physically there. 
that I am there, or indeed that I am someone else, I'm embodying someone else's and having their experiences. Um, this is this is Draw Me Close, uh, which was a, a show at the National Theatre, which combined one audience member and a live performer, and the uh, the audience member experienced the live performer as a virtual reality character in in a physical set. So they were um, they were physically there, but interacting virtually. And when you've got this, this is this is the you know the stuff of superpowers. Really, humans can transform in scale from the microscopic to the cosmic. They can travel in time, which I know is something that's uh, will be of interest to this audience in particular. They can teleport to anywhere in the world or the universe or what, what have you. And then there is this final one, which is the idea of changing perspective. We can experience the world through another's, um, through another's eyes, walk in another's pair of shoes, which is, you know, th this, is a, this is a powerful kind of empathy tool, I think, if done, if done correctly. There is a danger, of course, that it's not done correctly. And this is the term uncanny valley, I think, is one which is um, very prescient at the moment, which is the closer which is from things like uh, uh, CGI and robotics and things like this, is that the closer things get to being human, the more uncomfortable we are with them because we know they're not quite right. Um, I, I listened to a podcast which was saying that it's some, some deep-seated evolutionary thing about zombies or the dead or something like that, but I'm, I'm, I don't know quite about that. But we find these robots and these kind of sometimes the, the hyper-real CGI characters just uncomfortable because we know they're very close to being human, but they're not quite there yet. So actually being very realistic can actually be a barrier to empathy rather than, rather than opening it up. And I'd really love to talk, I always talk about this Joe, which, which I think is one of the best um, examples of, of embodiment. It's a, a show called Terminal 3 by a, a brilliant VR director or mixed reality director called Asad J. Malik. Um, it was based on his experiences of a, as, a, as a Muslim living in America and traveling through the American um, airport system. And he took the uh, real life experiences of a range of, of Muslim travelers uh, you did this experience in a, in a physical room with just a, a, a number of stools um, and you wore a HoloLens headset and you took the role of a border guard uh, questioning Muslim travellers. And as I say, all the words were, were, were what these people had really experienced. And you had to ask questions out loud to these characters that you saw in front of you. Um, and the act of actually having to say those questions, you know, which were often very difficult. It felt very, kind of deep, deeply uncomfortable, um, and the the, uh, the the figures of the travellers became they were sort of a spectral mass, and then they become became more solid as they really uh, um, had to kind of reveal personal details about themselves. Um, and it, it it's, it's a hugely memorable experience, and, and one I think which really use the technology to make the point that the director was trying to make in a, in a really clever and smart and memorable way. The third big feature I think is, is audience agency. Um, you know, we, we have, if done well, there is a, the audience can interact with immersive stories. They have a degree of, a, of, of ability to kind of influence um, what happens next. Um, so it's really important, I think, to have a clear understanding of what the audience role is in that. So we, 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 I was talking with some colleagues yesterday and we, we've sort of boiled it to down to these, these four, which is, are you there just to observe? So you can't really affect anything. Um, you're just there to observe. Or are you there to participate? So you are expected to act, but the action won't have any real consequences. Then there's advance, which is that the you, you need to do certain actions in order to move the narrative on. So they're kind of the, the, the actions are the triggers that advance the narrative. And then the, the kind of highest level is that you can actually affect the narrative. The actions you take change the way the story progresses in front of you. And the, the, you know, the, the thing I, the, one of the strongest lessons I've ever learned is the need for consistency of those roles throughout. You can't expect people to, to suddenly go from one scene to another where they're a passive observer to a kind of active 
participants, people need to know, you know, need to know what the rules are and what's expected of them. And that needs to be co consistent throughout. And we also need to be really mindful of rewarding that engagement. It's it, we're asking a lot from these audiences, um, and I think we need to make sure that the, that the rewards they get are, are worthwhile. Again, this this picture here is from a punch drunk show. If you're in uh, the audience for, for these shows, every now and then the performer takes one cat, one audience member off for, for, for a kind of one-to-one -one show, which is a really deep and powerful kind of experience that is outside of the normal narrative. Um, and, you know, so if you're doing, you know, my question is always, what's, what's the equivalent of that? If we're really asking so much, so much bravery really from the audience, how do we reward that with those types of kind of unique personal experiences? So why is immersive storytelling different? And I'm, I'm mindful of time, so um, we, we kind of go over this relatively um, briefly, I think, that the thing that alerted me to this was a, a research report about how the, if children had VR experiences at a very young age, quite quickly afterwards, those experiences were stored in their brains as memories that were indistinguishable from real life events. So their brains stored them as memories that, that were exactly the same as real things that they, they'd experienced, which seems, you know, it, it, was, it feels very alarming. Um, but actually, if you look at the way human, the human brain does experience the world, we take information from our senses, we compare those to the mental models that we have, you know, the all our experience of the world is, is actually just a, just a kind of hallucination in the brain. Um, the way that immersive storytelling happens by telling our senses is exactly the same way as we perceive the real world. Traditional storytelling is much more, you're actually trying to perceive the world through the brains of, a, brains of the characters. You're trying to decipher the world, the change, the motivations. Immersive storytelling, it's first hand, you, you're experiencing it yourself. So the changes in the story are actually changes that can happen to you. So that is, that is why the potential for memory creation is here, because you know, the, the, the brain is not able to distinguish between these types of immersive experiences and real life events that have happened to us. And that's a, an incredible power, but also an incredible responsibility. So we need to, we need to be really mindful of that. And the the degree to which memory can be formed, I think, is, is really dictated by, by how much the audience is able to generate the narrative themselves. How much is it? A, a, so on the left hand, this is the Leibovitz and Klug's uh, interactive storytelling spectrum. Um, so as you move towards the right, these are, as I say, fully player driven stories. So you're completely able to change the outcome of the story. And the argument is that the more to, towards the right you move, the more actually you're revealing the character of yourself through your actions. Whereas traditional stories are obviously revealing characters of, um, you know, the characters in the story itself. So this is the idea that um, has been started to talk about as story doing. So it's not storytelling, not, we're not receiving story. It's actually the, the physical action of triggering the narrative is creating those fundamentally different experiences, which are which are more akin to memory creation than kind of the delivery of empathy. So, what do we need to do? You know, the, in order to seize the opportunities here, organisations need to work in in really new ways. This is a, a an R and D workshop I, I ran at Historical Palaces for a drag show about James the first. Um, it's you know, the, the, the biggest mantle to cross, I think, is, is this who now decides or creates meaning, because actually the audience is an equal participant in the creation of meaning from these experiences. And that's something, you know, that organisations, it's certainly different from where they, they have operated historically. Um, and there's also the, the need to be very realistic about um, well, just how much this stuff costs, 
or how complex it is to develop or the huge range of expertise and skills that needs to be part of the, um, the partnerships. So being realistic about what your budgets can achieve is, 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 you know, you may be able to do a VR experience, but it probably, it might not be a good one. And, you know, VR, m most people doing VR now, it's, it's the first time they've tried it still. So we don't really want to be creating kind of those, those kind of bad showcases. But there are commercial, avail uh, commercial partnerships available. And I'd just like to um, uh, very briefly talk about uh, a show we've just announced, which is the Gunpowder Plot, which is a partnership between Historical Palaces and an immersive entertainment company called Layered Reality. And this will be a feature length immersive theatre show of Guy Fawkes and the Gunpowder Plot. Um, it will take place in uh, the vaults next to the Tower of London. It, and um, we're asking people to kind of step into this world of 1605. About a third of it will be delivered in virtual reality. The rest will be physical sets and live performers and a, and a kind of combination of projection mapping and other atmospheric effects like uh, uh, temperature and smell and, and all of those. Um, and this, this is the kind of the richness of, of the experience we're, we're hoping to make. So you will do things like help a priest escape a prison cell in the Tower of London and fly on a zip wire across the Thames, which is actually did happen in history, believe it or not. You will, you will be in a boat rowing up the Thames with Guy Fawkes delivering the barrels of gunpowder. Um, so the whole, whole range of these experiences that, that the audience will physically move through um, and it will be delivered, as I say, through this mix of, of technology effects and live performance and sets. So that's opening next May in, in London. Um, be great. It, it, when it's open and we get audience data and feedback, we'll have much more to say about that. So it's, it's still very much in, in production at the moment. So I'll just finish with, with audience considerations. You know, this stuff is still new. There are no known set of behaviours. Um, so we really do need to help the audience through this stuff. We really, you know, a phrase that's often used is, is onboarding. We also, as I say, this is powerful memory creation, memory creation potential. So we have a real duty of care to, to do that um, ethically and to manage the process so that people have, you know, the ability to, um, uh, to kind of respond and come down from those, from those experiences. Consistency of the audience role, as I said, is essential. And we really also need to think about the social context. Are people coming with kids? Are they coming as a social experience? Do they really want to do uh, a headset-based thing where they're kind of isolated from, from the people they're with? And as always, you know, just be realistic about audience beha behaviours. And at every, sta every stage, ask yourself, would I do that? Would I do that? Or do I know someone who would do that? Because the chances are if you wouldn't do it, then, then the audience wouldn't either. I'll just fly through. So, so in summary then, that the, the, the story, the audience and the technology are all codependent. Um, focus on the unique affordances of a technology because these, this unlocks new human experiences, new types of human behaviors. The type of immersion and the types of world you create, create very different types of experience for the audience. Story doing can create memories as well as empathy. The audience roles need to be clear and consistent and the engagement rewarded and audiences still need to be looked after carefully in these new types of experience. So thank you very much and um, hopefully there might be some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, so we have some time for questions. Um, first one is, do you know the opening time for the gunpowder show and how long it is going to run yes it opens on may the 6th next year uh, and it will be a long-running show as i said the, the commercial models of this mean that it will be on for as long as we possibly can <laughs> um, but it will be on for at least a year it sounds like a wonderful experience really keen yeah. on visiting yeah, I, I do hope so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real big step up, actually, in the kind of scale of it that's been enabled through this commercial partnership. Um, and 
yeah, so I, I look forward to hosting you, actually. Do, do let me know if you come over. Yes. Um, I actually have a question about Lost Palace. How long was that running and how many people took part of the experience? That ran for two summers in 2016 and 2017. So we were only able to have, uh, we needed access to the, to the entire banqueting house space to run it. So we were only able to, to, um, to have that for the summer periods. And I think it was it was about my memory's not quite here. It was about ten thousand people did it. Great, thanks. Yeah, so there are a few questions in the chat. Are you able to see them? Uh -huh. Here we are. I think the first one is from Daniel Rosqvist. Right. Can I find these different types of immersion that you presented somewhere? Um, uh, yes, they're kind of, they're, they're sort of, the idea of the sensory and the mental immersion as, as the different types is fairly well established. You'll find people describe them slightly, slightly differently. Um, it, I, would, I would just Google types of immersion, actually. I don't think there's any particular one place where that is the that is the best source for that. And so Frederick referenced the report that uh, the real fake memories. Yes, um, I can I can dig that out actually and put it in the chat. Shall I shall I do that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Great. And. Uh, Andreas, about being, re I'll read the question out because otherwise I'm just sitting in silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, about being realistic with what we can achieve, I know that it's hard to make the same type of AAA title experiences that get the gaming industry have budgets to do, but what do you think is the possibilities that the museum and cultural areas have? I guess we also have a few things that others don't. Uh, exactly, and, and I think it's if you've worked, if you've worked in a museum or a heritage attraction or something for any period of time, there's always stuff that people say, I wish we could, I, you know, the passion that lots, you know, you feel about these places. And I, I wish people could have that kind of, those are the things that you should be looking for technology to deliver, right? Don't try and, you know, don't just try and do all the things you normally do really well in a digital way. That's a complete waste of resources. What's that kind of new experience that, that, that has always been, you know, impossible previously? And I think if you focus, if you focus your money on that, then that can be, you know, because there's real integrity to it. There's, the, if, if you look at the uh, across, I mean, certainly in virtual reality, so much of the content is really bad taste, kind of, you know, unambitious. So the, the the kind of the the idea of, of this integrity and and an openness and you know that that, that cultural organisations can bring, uh, yeah, I I really do. I just think it's, I think your point's clever that you know don't try and compete on those terms. Create you know look at what's special, and then look at what you know would bring them alive for audiences, and then find the technology that delivers that. Right, Su Susanna, do you present trigger warnings or recommendations for the users before doing VR? Uh, a very good question, and, and that's really a, quite a live area, actually. Um, there is uh, a, there is a, a legal disclaimer form you have to sign before VR experiences now. So if you it's you can do it as part of the of the booking process, but people have to. It's not a, you, you can't do it in a kind of lazy terms and conditions way people have to actively kind of respond to it so um yes and then there are trigger warnings in in the kind of blurb for the show but i think once you're in the show that there's no i think it would comp it, it would break the world so they're all pre they're all as part of the ticketing and arrival at the venue stages do you know of any experiences that aren't driven by headphones which isolate viewers from one another I'm interested in collective immersive experiences. Ah, that's a very good question. 
Um, I suppose the question is not, is also um, about no devices because there are the bows the you know speaker manufacturers released these glasses that have uh, spatial sound computing power and speakers that deliver um, sound but they're not in your ear so it doesn't kind of block out the sound of the the rest of the world so they cut they're almost like augmented reality sounds because they are spatialized and and you can still hear the real world around so that might be so they're they're they were from Bose um, I don't know you know obviously there's museums and stuff are quite established with the, the kind of very the directional speakers and directional sound but I don't think those can do spatial sound yet. 